Zombie U, at its best, is terrifying and tense, a truly fantastic methodical survival horror game. Zombie U, at its worst, is clunky, unpolished, and confusing, a near-broken game depending on your luck with some of the bugs and which version of the game you play, and in terms of a cohesive vision, Zombie U is utterly devoid of one. One of the foundational mechanics of the game clashes so ridiculously hard with the dialogue and story, it's laughable. The ending as a whole, the jarring nature of some of the cutscenes, the characters and their presence in the game, the obviously mishandled PS4 and PC ports, or the cheesy and needless gimmicks of the Wii U version, there's so much here that's bad. But the high points of Zombie U were so intoxicating, I kept on pushing. There was even a time when I lost an hour of progress thanks to a random crash, and I swore up and down to never play this bug-ridden heap of garbage ever again, but I came back. Even when Zombie U wasn't hitting its stride and was more on the mediocre end of the spectrum, I could see the potential this game had clear as day. The dark atmosphere, the slow pace, the detailed environments to cautiously explore, the enemies being genuinely dangerous, the lack of resources, and even a few unique mechanics all combined together at times to provide an experience better than the sum of its parts. Even more than that, out of all the zombie games I've played, none have scared me as much as Zombie U. None. You could argue the method behind the scare devalued it slightly, but either way, there was a stretch of about 5 to 10 minutes where I was literally drenched in sweat, chills running through my body, my flight or fight response kicking in hard, pleading with me to simply turn the game off entirely. I'll leave the preamble at that for now and get started with talking about the game in depth. I honestly wouldn't recommend the game, if only due to all the bugs and crashing issues I had, but if what I said sounds intriguing and you can somehow acquire it at a very low price or completely free, yeah, maybe give it a shot. Just remember to save often. The game begins with an ominous prophecy that predicted the current plague that's all but wiped out the UK, turning people into zombies, it seems. Those who are prepared and have heeded his words shall be spared, and those that haven't will succumb to the plague's foul clutches or something. I figured this was just gobbledygook for the intro to set the mood, but there is a fair bit surrounding this prophecy as the game goes on, which is at the very least kind of interesting. Our character starts out in the streets of London, wandering around almost aimlessly, when a camera spots him and the person behind the camera offers to help. We follow their guidance, run through the subway station, down a vent, run past more zombies, and end up in a safe house that'll be our home base for the duration of the game. This scripted run from zombie sequence isn't fake, by the way. If you die, your character is dead, and the next survivor in the list is who you end up as, waking up in the respawn point. I'll touch on that later, but even still, it's nice that this spoopy chase section is real. The person who saved us calls himself The Prepper, since he's always prepared. He claims he knew this zombie plague was coming for a long time. He gives you the Prepper Pad, which has a lot of uses that I won't get to as of yet. I really hope everyone is listening to this specific sentence and the few that follow, as this is crucial information for the rest of the video. Because Prepper Pad is so awful to say 26 times in a video, I'll be referring to this device as Jerry from now on. If I say Jerry, I'm referencing this device the Prepper gave the player in the beginning of the game. I mean, Prepper is also annoying, but it's the character's name, so I can't just call him Al Horford or something. Well, I mean, his real name is John, as it says in a few of the backstory documents, but I already recorded this entire script, so I'm sorry, it's too late. The Prepper is what I'll be calling him for the rest of the video, a good 50 or so more times, get used to it. <sighs> sorry, Al Horford, maybe I can come up with another way to reference the Atlanta Hawks. Anyway, moving on. Jerry is meant to represent and mirror the Wii U tablet controller, much like the Sheikah Slate in Breath of the Wild, since that game was also planned to be a Wii U exclusive. It handles a lot differently in the PS4 version, but most of the changes are appreciated, except one or two that I'll talk about soon. This is the way the Prepper will communicate with you from now on, through Jerry. You can have him talk through the controller on the PS4, which is really cool and immersive. However, if you do that, you can't record the audio through any capture card you have hooked up, as it doesn't go through the HDMI cable. So unfortunately, I had to switch to the TV audio, otherwise I wouldn't be able to play any of his lines for you all. Sad. In the safe house is your bed, which you can sleep on to save your game, a chest where you can store items you aren't using or want to save for later, and some monitors that are connected to CCTV cameras all around the game world, which will come in handy for exploration down the line. As an introduction to the melee combat, you're told to grab the cricket bat from the last person who the prepper tried to help, now a zombie, and bash his brains in. You then obtain a very important item, the backpack, which the game calls Bob, B-O-B, standing for Bug Out Bag. The UK setting itself is great, if only for the sake of variety in my opinion, but it's nice that it extends to how the characters talk. I'm obviously no expert, and I'm sure these accents aren't amazing or anything, but the different terminology was welcome. 
The prepper also calls zombies blighters, which is a name I haven't heard used before in other zombie games, likely used because it's the UK, and they also call the plague a blight in some of the lore. In the backpack is your starting equipment, a flashlight, a handgun, and now the cricket bat you just grabbed. The cricket bat is the only melee weapon available on the Wii U version, but for the PS4 and PC ports, which came out three years later by the way, they added in a shovel and a bat with nails in it, both being better than the cricket bat, and are in certain set locations that serve as an extra reward for exploration. Well, I mean, they're hard to miss, but even still. As much as I preferred using the stronger equipment, I can't deny how much the cricket bat helped with this game's unique identity. The melee combat itself is everything it needed to be, slow and deliberate, meshing mostly well with the spooky and grounded setting. Hold the left trigger to pull back, press the right trigger to swing. The timing is tricky at first, but it becomes natural the more you do it, and netting a zombie head explosion is satisfying enough even if it takes a half dozen swings sometimes. You feel properly vulnerable when you're forced to rely on it, either because you're literally out of ammo or simply trying to conserve it, and it's a trustworthy companion, always there, always there, to save you from an incoming zombie bite. All of that being said, the Cricket Bat does more than help you survive as you play, it helps the game itself stand out, setting it apart from other zombie titles, giving it some distinct personality while also firmly establishing the setting. I've seen people talk about Zombie U online and refer to it as the game where you bash zombies with a cricket bat, and yeah, that mixed with the fact that you can go to Buckingham Palace, public transportation isn't just a myth, and encounter zombies with little adorable bearskin hats on? Oh man, speaking as an American, this is all just the dog's bollocks. Fudge told me to say that, blame him if that sounded dumb. The backpack is the context for your limited inventory space, and the differences between the PS4 and Wii U versions are kind of ridiculous. I played the PS4 port first and was almost always near capacity, having to repeatedly decide between a flare or a healing item and other such inventory choices. I can totally dig this limited space to work with, but the problem is, you can't remove your starting equipment ever. The pistol, cricket bat, and flashlight aren't allowed to be dropped or placed in your item chest at all. You can put shotguns, rifles, and other melee weapons in the chest, but not the three starting items. This means that yes, when you're currently using the shovel or bat with nails in it on the PS4 version, you still have to keep the cricket bat in your inventory completely wasting space. A charitable interpretation of this would be to pretend that the cost of using the better melee weapon is worth the extra slot the cricket bat still takes up, but come on now, this is just a silly oversight. It gets funnier though, as this inventory kerfuffle has more layers to it, but it makes it all the more confusing. In the Wii U version, you get six shortcut spaces on the gamepad itself, and 10 backpack slots. The six spaces don't count against you, they're essentially six extra slots, all being far more accessible in a rush than the god-awful D-pad favorites the PS4 version implements. That's 16 slots in total, remove three for the cricket bat, handgun, and flashlight, 13. In the PS4 version, your shortcuts don't get the benefit of not counting against you, so those four don't matter to the equation. Yet, you do get four more inventory spots in the backpack itself. 14 in the starting backpack for the PS4, versus 10 in the Wii U. Remove the three usual suspects like before, and we're left with 11 slots to play with. 11 for the PS4, versus 13 for the Wii U. I guess I don't get it. Were they trying to balance the game to be a bit harder? Surely not, since the melee attacks are so much faster on the PS4. In the original Wii U edition, your swings get more spaced out, looking like your character is losing energy almost. This makes up-close combat a lot more dangerous than the consistent and quick whap 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 of the PS4 version. If the intention wasn't to make the PC and PS4 ports more challenging, why wouldn't they even up these inventory numbers, especially given that you can't drop the cricket bat, but you can obtain better melee weapons? They obviously put thought into it, this seems deliberate, but I just don't understand the thought process. I think I actually prefer the balancing with the fewer inventory slots, it makes it feel like you're planning for your next short expedition into the dangerous overworld, much like Resident Evil, but not being able to remove the cricket bat, even when you get a better replacement for it, is simply a terrible blight on the game. The flashlight is also different between the two, but this time the changes are for the best. The PS4 version has a normal and a high beam setting, which I became quite accustomed to, so going back and seeing that the Wii U only had the low beam setting was kind of deflating. There, though, the battery recharges almost instantly. The visual for the flashlight battery is on the gamepad itself, so forgive the terrible quality footage here, but man, that little number shoots up to 100 lightning quick. In the PS4 port, it isn't a number, but a meter in the upper right, and it's painfully slow by comparison. I don't hate that change as much as I thought I would, however, since it did heighten the horror in that one specific scary part, 
and even with some other spooky ambushes, so I guess it's not so bad. Since we're already talking about the HUD, it should be pretty clear that the TV screen for the Wii U edition is basically empty save for the environment, whereas the PS4 version shows your map, your flashlight battery, your health, and your ammo when necessary. All of that is found in the gamepad for the Wii U, and this was a big focus in development apparently. The game is intentionally slower paced, and also fairly punishing, and the fear of looking down at the gamepad while you play, keeping your eyes off the potential zombies on the TV screen, was the whole point. I can't say I particularly like using the Wii U gamepad, for basically every Wii U game I own actually, it always felt cumbersome and unsatisfying, but I did appreciate that tension for Zombie U. It feels like the game was actually designed with those short breaks in mind, where your eyes are off the danger while you hunt for the right supplies. That's sorta still there with the PS4 version, since it essentially acts as a Dark Souls pause screen where the game keeps playing in the background, but the ability to go back and forth by looking up and down with your own eyeballs makes it a little smoother. I played my share of Wii U games that try to utilize the gamepad, and I think this is the best use for it. It's essentially the inventory screen from Wind Waker HD, sure, but the fact that this is a horror game, and they take advantage of you looking away from the screen to heighten the mood, it's great. There are many other, far worse uses of the gamepad coming up, so don't you worry, pointless gimmick and Wii U haters. The map screen is also far better on the gamepad than it is on the PS4 heads-up display. I don't mind having the minimap on the TV screen, but you can't zoom it in or see it in a larger size. Going to the map screen when in your backpack menu doesn't show the same thing. All you have to work with is that little shitty thing in the corner. I've also had it happen where the map would glitch out and spaz all over the place, which I thought was intentional to give the illusion that it's fading away when losing connection in the palace or something. But after seeing the Wii U version, I'm not so sure about that. There are times where a jammer nearby will cause your map to stop working, but that's not the same thing. Those are awesome, and this is awful. It honestly becomes distracting when it starts acting up. I won't talk about the other bugs I had in the PS4 version besides the crashing, but I'll put some clips in now of some of the lesser stuff I didn't feel the need to go in depth with. The Jerry you were given early on has some interesting features I haven't gotten to yet. While many games will have enemies appear on your minimap automatically, in Zombie U, at least for the first third of the game or so, you have to activate the sensor yourself. A circle will extend from your arrow on the minimap, and anything moving will set off a beep sound effect and a red dot will appear. After an upgrade to the Jerry, it'll keep pulsing without your input. This motion sensor mechanic is fantastic when in tense situations for a variety of reasons. The sound design itself is outstanding. The cold, emotionless beeping noise when a potential threat is around the corner can be nerve-wracking on its own. It gives off alien air duct scene vibes. And when a grouping of red dots all suddenly appear and the cluster of individual beeps rattle off in a row, it can be seriously frightening. Even better, that red dot might not always be a zombie. Anything moving will set it off, and the ravens and rats that populate the city make for great little heart rate spikers. Some zombies can even slip under your radar, and I suppose I mean that literally. The ones that look dead but pop up when you get close, naturally, won't set off the motion detecting Jerry. So not only can you get faked out by the animals, not all of the enemies show up. Early on is this the most effective, since your Jerry is still at its lowest upgrade level, and repeatedly pinging for enemies manually, while not knowing if it'll be a zombie or not, facilitates that sense of unease when navigating through the dark city streets and sewers. It works really well with the already engrossing atmosphere. In the palace, you'll get an upgrade that makes the minimap ping all the time on its own, which is obviously beneficial, but I did prefer the tension of having to do it myself. Along with the minimap motion detector, you can hold up the Jerry and scan the environment. This lets you see through walls and doors even. At its base level, you'll see whether an object has items you can loot or not, and with the upgrade, it'll outright show you what's inside, crazy enough. It also tells you if there are enemies or animals nearby, and those red dots will stay there when looking through the Jerry, and they'll even remain on your map afterwards. The nice thing here is that infected could mean a corpse of a zombie or a real blighter that's alive and dangerous, so there's some ambiguity even here. The range increases for the Jerry as you get upgrades for it, 20 meters to 30 meters I believe, which is a pretty big difference given the relatively cramped play space. You'll use the Jerry to scan other objects and to find secrets as well, which are fantastic uses for it. Finding and scanning the CCTV junction boxes gives you the mini-map for the area you're in and allows you to track items in that area back at your home base through the monitors. This really only comes in handy when you're completely out of a resource, die twice and are retrieving your guns again, or for quest-related items near the end, but either way, it's a cool mechanic. 
The junction boxes themselves, given their many benefits, are genuinely a phenomenal reward for exploration. This is one of the few elements of the game that just worked so perfectly for me. You're already methodically wandering through every environment to the next objective anyway, always on the hunt for items that can help you stay alive, and while flares, ammo, and other consumables are found on the ground, on a table, or in a lootable container, the junction boxes are on a wall somewhere, sometimes hidden in plain sight, others jammed into a crevice. It's just so clever. Not only will you be looking in different areas of the screen when searching for it when compared to the other items I've mentioned, what's more, the mechanic that grants you access to the map information, thus helping you explore the environment, is in and of itself a discoverable object in the environment. It's a poetic harmony, I really dig it. In that same vein, the jammers that are found in certain areas that block your jerry entirely are fucking genius. You won't be able to see or mark anything through the Jerry vision, and the mini-map is essentially frozen. You'll just see what was visible the moment you entered the Jammer's range. As much as I loved Jerry's functionality, I did notice how often I relied on it as I went on, and these moments where it stopped working were genuinely nerve-wracking. The biggest priority became finding the Jammer and taking it out, but in one specific instance, that meant crawling through a vent towards where I already knew potential enemies were. It was amazing. I was definitely on edge and stressed out, but that's the goal of horror games, so it was a huge success. The story and lore behind Zombie U is filled with conspiracies and prophecies, and something you'll end up doing is hunting for secret messages. The Jerry Vision emits a blacklight, allowing you to spot things written on walls and windows and such. I can easily see how all of this would get on some players' nerves, the frequent stopping and going thanks to the Jerry usage, but because the game is already so slow-paced, I think it works out well. The only aspect about it all I could do without is seeing enemies and items through the Jerry Vision. I think that undermines the motion detector a bit. I almost wonder if the opening half of the game was made better for me since I didn't use the Jerry Vision in those opening hours, only sticking to the radar. I'm not sure. The blacklight gimmick, though? 100% in favor. I had an absolute blast sleuthing for hidden words on walls, following arrows, deciphering clues to find items in the environment, or the passwords to secret areas. Incredible, truly. But the game itself being so tiny and having many problems weighing it down, even at its most enjoyable, it was hard not to think, Oh man, I wish these ideas were put into a better game. The CCTVs gave me a similar sensation. The idea that you can use them to seek out specific items in the areas you've activated them in is so cool, but you really don't need to use it for much beyond one or two edge cases. A lot of potential here for a bigger, grander game, but so much holding it back. The differences between the Wii U and PS4 usage of the Jerry aren't as dark as the inventory, but they're still pretty annoying, this time the PS4 port coming out on top. When you're in the blacklight first-person vision on the Wii U, you have to look down on the gamepad. The TV screen will show your character in third person with a look at your Wii U gamepad prompt on it. Not horrible in and of itself, but to scan for anything, you have to physically touch the gamepad screen and hold it down until the circle fills up. In the PS4 version, you simply have to aim at the thing you want scanned, and it'll happen automatically. It's much smoother, and I vastly prefer it. Likewise, to ping for enemies manually in the early game, on the PS4, you just gotta press the triangle button. Effortless and simple, yet in the Wii U version, it's a touchpad thing, meaning you'll have to look down and tap, tap, tap away for the motion detector to turn on each and every time. What a tedious hassle. You might find this complaint odd, since I dug that idea for the inventory, why don't I like taking my eyes off the TV screen now? I think this is a case of everything in moderation. Looking down to check your map now and then, or even better, to access your inventory, feels fine, since it's spread out enough. If other players are anything like me, though, they'll be checking for enemies almost all the time, or at the very least, using the Jerry Vision to scan and find items, and doing it as frequently as I was doing it early on just feels awkward. It verges into pointlessly clunky territory. That's a great segue into the next Wii U and PS4 comparison, actually, since, good lord, Ubisoft Montpellier really wanted to get the most out of the Wii U functionality. Gyroscope aiming for certain things, looking at the pad when aiming with the turrets and sniper rifle, tapping the screen to scan objects with Jerry, sliding the lockpick back and forth with your finger when unlocking doors, tapping on the screen when in your inventory, dragging and dropping items in and out, tapping away at your hotbar, tapping away for the motion detector, tapping away to remove barricades, tapping away to open shortcuts, tapping away to acquire zombie juice. Like, goddamn, with all these gimmicks, was this game meant to be a Rayman Raving Rabbids game originally or something? Oh, it was. Huh. This might sound like a petty complaint, but the tapping the screen bits look fucking terrible when compared to the rest of the game world, they don't fit in at all, and they're simply awkward as hell. These actions just feel so unnatural. 
These were carried over for the PS4 version, but you mash one of the buttons, and the dumb prompt doesn't look as bad since it's much smaller. I'll take this over poking the play screen like I'm waiting for my order at Applebee's, thanks. It's also a pain to have to aim the mounted machine gun while looking down on the gamepad. Talk about feeling awkward and unnatural, this flat out doesn't make any sense. At least with the Jerry, your character is looking at their pad much like you are with yours. Aiming the turret this way is nonsensical. In a way, this is the most mid-game ever created, as much like the 2022-2023 Atlanta Hawks, for every win, there's a loss to balance it out. Wading through deep enough water causes your character to hold their precious bug-out bag above their heads, which makes perfect sense and could induce anxiety in a player, given that they're defenseless for any incoming zombie attacks. However, it makes no sense that crouching to enter vents or crawl under objects is a contextual button prompt instead of simply giving the player a dedicated crouch button. This could have been a choice to lessen the control a player has, making them feel more vulnerable, but it's hard not to think how much better a game like this could be with full control of my character's actions. The load screen for when you're traveling between locations is fun, and I quite like the jingle that plays, which always seems to get stuck in my head. But the loading time on the Wii U version is already out of control, and yet, even then, when you spawn in, the door closest to you, which leads to the area you wanted to go to in the first place, won't open until the area is done loading. What on earth? The sequence where you run to the helicopter in the midway part of the game is surprisingly well done, but the real ending being after the credits, where you have to run back to the same area randomly, feels completely out of nowhere and entirely disconnected from the cutscene that preceded it. It's nice that the animation for checking a corpse only triggers when they have something. If they're empty, it'll just say empty. But the same quality of life detail wasn't afforded for the other lootable containers. Your character will open drawers even when there's nothing inside them. Your character audibly reacting in a panic when near enemies is a fun, immersive touch. But the backpack ruffling sound effect constantly playing when you're in your inventory, even when you're simply reading a piece of lore, is dumb and distracting. Barricading doors to keep zombies at bay presents itself early on as an important gameplay mechanic, but like most things in the game, it's a fun concept, but not much is done with it. The wooden planks don't stack in the inventory space, so keeping even two or three handy, especially on the PS4 version of the game, is almost never worth it. This is even more disappointing when factoring in the home base, as you do have to fend off a wave of zombies early on in the game, and it definitely feels like that'll be a recurring thing, but it just... never happens again. Seems like a missed opportunity at the very least. With how often the prepper talks about keeping the base secure and safe, Maybe this was something the devs wanted to implement as a feature, but it either got cut for time, or what we're left with is a de facto one-off tutorial from the remnants of a failed idea. May as well cut the wooden boards, then. It's such a shame, since the times where a door was boarded up already, and you can hear the zombies banging on them, ready to burst them open, were nerve-wracking. The anticipation of when the door would fly off its hinges was working as intended, but it's such a rare occurrence where boarding up a door yourself would ever be worth it. The only times I could see it coming in handy is when having to reload a lot of your guns, or escaping from a horde of zombies back to your home base, but neither will happen often, if ever, when you play it safe. I played around with it more on the Wii U, and it works in tandem with the mines well, and in some areas it can be beneficial with the window to shoot zombies through, but again, the potential outweighs the execution. The visuals of the game are on the whole a delight. There's an appropriate amount of debris and objects scattered around, the sky is always overcast or dark as night, and the atmosphere of some of the tunnel areas is fantastic, perfect for setting the tone and affording the zombies a fair chance to give you a scare. The grounded, immersive style the game goes for does wonders to sell this oppressive setting. There's countless examples of a solid setup where a zombie spooked me because I was so engrossed in the game world. The sound design has a distinct feel to it as well, with the strings getting more intense depending on how close zombies are or when you're in a combat encounter. <laughs> and the piano key is closing it out after a kill. When you're in the palace, there's classical music in the background for an area or two, which is a welcome clash, offering another layer of eeriness when exploring this zombie-ridden hellscape. All of that praise for the visuals and sound design being said, the dirty lens effect found all over the Wii U version and in the cutscenes of the PS4 port 
are laughably stupid. This is a first person game, what, our eyes are dirty? The cutscenes where characters speak in person have atrocious pacing issues where they leave a gigantic gap between their sentences while essentially doing nothing. Yeah. If you'll forgive me for a moment, I'm sure you can help me. I say, steady on, old girl. It caught me off guard so much that I thought the game was broken during the first big gap. As well, the jarring transition to one cutscene in particular, where you have to find a person to trade you some gas, is so tonally out of place it feels like it's from an entirely different game. Please, come in, come in. You're safe here. Do you bring news? You've been gone so long. The relatively mundane story beat that forced me into the area where I was scared beyond belief was 100% worth it in retrospect, but the order and mandatory nature of the objectives and their lack of logic is confusing and frustrating, especially when nearing the end. Utilizing flares, molotovs, mines, and grenades with clumps of zombies is thrilling when the plan comes together, but the careful use of your tools is almost entirely put to waste when the game can crash on you for simply going into your inventory. I didn't have any crashes on the Wii U version, but it's tough to say if that's enough to unambiguously claim the port of the game is the issue. Given that you can only save via sleeping in the beds, this can undo so much progress that you might feel it's best to just run past enemies in your attempt at getting back to where you were. While many possible jump scare ambushes from zombies are surprisingly honest, such as this one where he grabs you when you walk by, but because he exists in the area already, you can kill him beforehand, allowing you to crawl through unscathed. There's plenty of the more run-of-the-mill, walk-past trigger-line ones, where zombies kind of just appear out of nowhere. I don't hate these types, but it's hard not to see them as inferior at this point. Some zombies have helmets on, which block your bullets. This small but significant difference makes them one of my favorite enemies in the game, as performing a 1-2 combo on them, where you whack at the pinata until the helmet comes off, then fire a gun at their face, is supremely satisfying. That said, they show up far too often for their own good, and the majority of the enemy's reactions to being hit, where they stagger back and do a little growl at you, just become silly after you see it for the dozenth time. The guns all feel mostly pitiful if you don't score a headshot, except the crossbow, where even with the headshot it feels pathetic. And the fact that you can't aim down the sights with the carbine is odd, but being able to upgrade your guns isn't horrible. More exploration rewards to find is what you want in this quasi-open world game, and they don't even take up an inventory slot, which is a nice consideration, I guess. Except, for some reason, the game shoves the spread upgrade at you literally ten times as often as the other types, and considering you can only increase a stat for each gun one time, there's clearly something wrong with the distribution of the spread upgrades. They're fucking everywhere, seriously! The skill leveling for the guns also feels completely unnecessary. Sure, it's another thing to lose progress with on death, and it might encourage you to use your guns when you might otherwise have stuck to a melee option, but, like, why to both of those things? The Wii U version already has a great incentive to use your guns, the enemies are so tanky, and your cricket bat is weak and slow. I'm not opposed to the idea of leveling up your character, but this just doesn't hit the mark, it feels very tacked on. The lockpicking minigame being something a bit different is refreshing, even if it is exceedingly trivial, and the doors overall knock it out of the park in this game when it comes to variety, certain ones requiring a keycard, some a specific code, a few you can lockpick, and others making use of your jerry to hack into them. You should all know how I feel about doors at this point, so this was genuinely great, but... Actually, you know what? The complaint I was going to say here to balance it out isn't bad enough to equal how much I appreciated the doors in this game. I won't even mention it, the doors are just awesome. Some of the special infected variants are kind of unique, and I'd say they're all mostly fair, such as the bomber being able to be seen through a door thanks to the Jerry and having an audio cue that tagged along with them. But this specific ambush right here is horribly put together. Walking the plank on this narrow board wouldn't be terrible in and of itself, the zombies at the bottom all too eager to see you fall off is neat, 
but this spitter placed at the end is utterly ridiculous. It'll obviously force players into making a choice, either attacking from far away if they can, running at him, or fleeing, but the crazy thing is, you can't climb back up on this ledge you just top down from. The contextual X button prompt shows up in other areas of the game for you to climb shit, even in this section right before this, but not here for some reason. This led to me dying multiple times, since I didn't have any ammo for the guns I had in the item chest, and only had molotovs and mines, the former being entirely wasted if you throw them at the zombies in the water, I guess. Although the death mechanic, where you'll need to loot your corpse, or fight off a zombie that looks an awful lot like your former character to get your items back, is neat, and genuinely fairly novel for the time, remember this was 2012, only one year after Dark Souls came out, it makes literally zero sense with the narrative. This one will take a little longer to explain. There's two ways of playing, the permadeath way, where dying means your save file is gone and you have to start all the way over, or the normal way, where death means you keep playing, but as a new survivor that's waking up in the safe house. Your items, like I've said, are gone, except for your starting cricket bat, handgun, and flashlight, and whatever you've saved in the item chest. Again, the idea of having to kill your previous, now zombified self to get back your stuff is great mechanically and thematically. In a different game, this could be a fantastic addition, but zombie use story and objectives tied to it are heavily dependent on the prepper and a couple other characters talking to you and referencing your previous actions. Every time you load back into the game, the prepper has some bit of dialogue that he recites to you, almost as a way of reintegrating a player back into the swing of things, reminding them of their current goal. I've told you, you can't keep sticking your neck out for other people. But this also plays when you wake up as a new survivor after dying. You can't keep sticking your neck out for other people. He just pretends you're the same person and that nothing has changed? A similar thing happened to me with a different character, Sandra. I'd like to note, by the way, she was the cause of one of my deaths. She told me to stop standing like a sitting duck and move it, so I followed her advice and ran as fast as possible, but then I died thanks to her blowing up explosives nearby with her sniper rifle. And me whacking a bomber zombie with my bat. Yeah, I guess that happened too. In my defense, this was the second time I was doing this, as the time before I got past this section, the game crashed and I had to do it all over. Fucking hell. Uh, the point is, after my survivor blows up and I'm given a new survivor to control, she contacts my new survivor on the radio after this bit as if she's still talking to the one she blew up. I've tried my best to rationalize all this, I really have. Maybe the prepper saves many people, his dialogue does say not again when you die after all. And obviously with the ending in mind, he, you know, he definitely does save other people. And maybe he tells them to do the same things every time, and this new survivor has already been briefed on everything the last person did, and already has a bug out bag, and the Jerry, and other characters know who they are, and... No, it's not happening. I don't think you can explain this part away, sadly. If you've been paying attention to the screen, I'm sure you've also noticed the score number popping up every death. Yeah, I really don't get what they were going for, but you were meant to survive as long as you can, defeating enemies and completing the story, and you... I guess get ranked on a leaderboard or something against other players? I have no idea why anybody would care about that, honestly. This is a short and sweet, self-contained zombie horror game. It didn't need this forced multiplayer ranking system. I do think it's quite funny that the first three survivors you play as are fixed in the rotation. Basically, you'll always be that white guy in the intro cutscene, then after one death you'll be a white chick with a ponytail, then a black guy who was a police officer or something. The internet says it's randomized after the first three, but either way, what an interesting decision. My white dude on the Wii U version lasted all but two minutes while I tested the validity of the opening zombie chase. Poor guy. I've mentioned the CCTVs helping with a few edge cases, and one such use is when you die twice in a row. If you fail to retrieve the items from your corpse or zombified version of the last guy, they don't vanish, they get spread out amongst different areas in the game world. Scattered in all directions like the Dragon Balls after making a wish. The Dragon Radar equivalent is the CCTV cameras, as you can see which locations have weapons and items contained within them. A very cool detail, but like I said, one that would likely have more value in a different and more consistently good game. If I'm being perfectly honest though, I think the game overall would be better without this death mechanic in the first place. If dying just reverted you back to the last time you saved, that would be punishment enough, I think. Beds are scarce, and while you could theoretically waste a lot of time walking back and taking the shortcuts to the home base to sleep after small victories, the inconvenience of that playstyle would likely curtail it for most players trying to get the most out of the game. The sleeping in a bed save system on its face doesn't really do much for the game as is, so you could honestly remove those and just replace it with dumb save rooms and it'd be fine. 
Sure, myself and others may complain that it's uninspired and kinda weird, but what's currently in Zombie U feels like it's selling us on something that doesn't exist. I've already talked about how odd it is that there aren't any home base defenses besides that singular one early on in the game after you return from the supermarket, but what's more, in the tutorial section after you grab the cricket bat, the prepper says, more than 20 hours awake and your decision making goes to pieces, don't neglect your sleep. More than 20 hours awake and your decision making goes to pieces, don't neglect your sleep. And that sure sounds like it's hinting at some sort of mechanic or system involving sleep, involving your character's energy levels, involving time in some way, but nothing ever comes of it. Is it really all just elaborate window dressing for the sake of contextualizing how you save the game? By now, you have to see what I'm talking about with this game. It's all over the place. So many cool ideas are present in Zombie U clear as day, while many are half-baked or aren't fully developed or done much with, and others are hinted at but aren't explored. It's such a wild ride, and the two major deviations from the norm, the school and the arena battle, when compared side by side, are the embodiment of what I'm getting at here. These two one-off sections were the polar opposite in every conceivable way, except for one. Both were objectives that sprung up that had nothing to do with the central plot of the story. You were forced into each of these situations, even though the incentive to do them literally came down to the text on screen telling you to do it. Also, yes, the school was the incredibly scary part I was talking about in the beginning. We're at long last, finally here. Before we get to the scary part I was talking about in the beginning, however, we need to start talking about the story. <laughs> my viewers are such suckers. As interesting as I think the backdrop is for this zombie apocalypse, I can't pretend they really did much with it. Long story short, there was an old alchemist slash scientist, John D, who worked with Elizabeth I, and he studied plagues and catastrophes and was able to predict them in the future. He said he spoke to angels, and they were his way of foretelling major events, such as the Great Plague of London in 1665, the Great Fire that stopped it, and the First and Second World Wars, to name just a few. A decade or so before his death, he made a prediction known as the Black Prophecy, where some type of apocalyptic event would sweep over London in the year 2012. The problem is, his warning on this one fell to deaf ears, as the power had shifted from Elizabeth to King James I, who viewed him as a nutcase, and condemned him and anyone else who parroted this nonsense. By the time King Charles the whatever came into power, he saw that there was merit in Dee's old predictions, so he formed a task force known as the Ravens of Dee to research Dee's work and try to prevent the catastrophes in the first place. Well, it's now 2012, and the zombie outbreak is a thing. Maybe Dee was right again after all. The Prepper says at one point he was a part of the Ravens of Dee and helped them construct many of the fortifications we end up finding in the game, but something happened and he's now no longer associated with the Ravens and views them very negatively. They share basically all the same views, they follow the same prophecy, but there's one key difference. The Ravens are still trying to stop the plague, working on a cure, trying to help everyone, and the Prepper believes that's cherry picking, you can't play God. The only people who will be saved from this are the ones who heeded his words and prepared. This mentality persists throughout the game with the Prepper. He always talks about looking out for number one, yourself, and mocks and shames the ignorant masses who chose to party instead of prepare. Preparation is all he cares about, I guess, really living up to his moniker. At one point, you meet the doctor in Buckingham Palace. He's the only one left to continue the research on a cure. The tasks he asks of you are mostly related to John Dee's old books and documents. Fetch quests, essentially, and while I don't hate them outright, since it's a decent excuse to go out and explore new areas, there really should have been some back-and-forth dialogue with our character, showing us that he or she wants to help. Us just following his orders the moment we meet him, simply because the game objectives tell us to, makes no sense. That, sadly, is a problem that keeps propping up throughout the game. This is one of the biggest issues Zombie U faces, as so much of it works against itself when it comes to the narrative, quest design, and character motivations. Before finishing how undercooked the prophecy gimmick was and where it led to, we need to start from the beginning. Prepper saves us, he makes us start up the generator, we grab the Jerry, bug out bag, and cricket bat, and he tells us to go fix the cameras in the supermarket district. We haven't seen him in person yet, but since he definitely did help us, I can totally understand following through with this. After we come back, the wave of zombies attack the home base, then the Prepper has an idea. Go ransack Buckingham Palace for supplies. We lose connection with him while we're in there and meet the doctor. The moment he asks us to do something, our objectives shift immediately to helping him out. The first object to fetch is within the palace, so we're still without word from the Prepper. The second one is in a certain apartment building, and this is when we exit the palace. Again, our objective marker gives no fucks about the Prepper as of right now, we just care about the doctor. 
We get into the district where the apartment is located, and the prepper chimes in, confused as to why we would be in this area looking for supplies. It's worth noting here that he didn't contact me after I first left the palace. There was an entire area I walked through to get here, and he didn't even ask me about what I found at the palace. He didn't have eyes on me, since there the connection was bad and there were no cameras initially anyway, and now he wonders why I'd be here, even though minutes in, I find a double barrel shotgun and he gets giddy over the find. Now we're talking. Double the barrels for double the gun. I'm sure it's already evident that this one-way dialogue shtick with our silent but ever-changing survivor character doesn't work, but it gets worse. Eventually, hilariously, the prepper figures out where you are. You're at Ron Friedman's place. He's the one who led the Ravens astray. He tells us not to believe a word he says. At this point, the prepper doesn't know why we're there, but he's just kinda okay with us randomly going from the palace right to here. The prepper then helps us get into the apartment where we need to be, and this area overall is genuinely pretty great. The elevator ambush, both of them really, crawling through some of the vents, being in an apartment setting itself with its kitchen and dining room environments. There is music playing in the background, getting louder and louder as we progress, and eventually we find the source of the ruckus. There's a DJ booth going, with big speakers, bright lights, and even a dance floor. You can interact with the turntables to turn the music off, and the previously distracted zombies will come after you instead. Funny enough, turning the music back on sees them going back to their tunes and leaving you be. This is yet another example of how the game, at times, is fantastic. This is just a perfect little detour from the oppressive nature of the rest of the game. What makes it all the better is you can use this to your advantage. If you keep the music untouched, you can slip by without having to use any of your resources to clear a way for zombies. We bring the book back to the scientist, and now he thinks the ravens have the panacea code, which could... unlock a cure. Alrighty. Now our objective is to collect all seven of these letters, which we can't really do as of yet anyway, since some are locked behind items and upgrades we acquire later on. When you get back to the safe house, well, now you have a new task. The prepper says you should raid the military armory. He knows someone there from Desert Storm. Go meet with him and get some better weapons and some C4. For some reason. On the way, we hear Sandra over the general radio, calling for all survivors to meet at the Tower of London for evac. The prepper knows who that is. He thought she was dead. He says not to trust her. She's more likely to take your bob from your dead hands. This doesn't trigger anything different from our omniscient objective list. We continue on, grab the key card from the dead military guy, access the supplies, and once we're in here, the prepper says good job, return to the safe house, but Sandra intercepts our comms, telling our character directly to come with her to the evac point. Even though the game is obviously pitting these two characters against each other, Sandra and the prepper, the objectives say to go with Sandra. You can even go back to the safe house in between, and the prepper says nothing. Okay, I guess I have to go with Sandra. This is why we needed the C4, by the way, so we could blow up the garbage blocking the sewer tunnel on the way to Sandra's evac. Now the prepper finally takes notice, and shames us for running away with the birds, and it's here where he talks about the differences between them, how they cherry-picked T's prophecy, apparently, and all that. He's clearly upset with us. I won't help you. But once you grab that sniper rifle... Oh man, the prepper can't help but reminisce about his past. That's a 770, that. I used to shoot naps up the arse with one of those. Even more, once you find the shortcut, you can easily return to the safe house for a nap, and the prepper doesn't say anything at all about you coming back to use the bed he provided for you. Regardless, this whole next section is one of my favorites in the game. The sewer tunnel, where you might get attacked by zombies hidden by falling water, having to seek out the way forward with the black light hints, and so on, all the way until you finally get out of the sewer and have to race to the helicopter, which is accompanied by climactic sounding music. This whole section here is great. It makes you forget about all the bad parts in other areas of Zombie U. In a hilarious turn of events, the evac chopper is taken out by a flock of ravens, and Sandra says this isn't the end. She'll contact us when she has another way out. Thematically, the ravens being the reason our evac plans were ruined is... something. I'm not sure. It ties in, it makes sense on paper, but are the devs trying to say that the ravens are actually a part of this and the prepper wasn't totally wrong? That there really is no saving anyone that isn't prepared? After this, the game kind of just plops you down and tells you to go back to the safe house. Oh, okay, I'll go crawling back with my tail between my legs, I guess. Once you're back, the prepper says he told you so, that this is what D predicted. There's no escaping it. The plague will only end when a fire of black angels sweeps across the world. We don't respond, naturally, but water under the bridge, I suppose. All is well with us and the prepper. Now the generator is out, so we have to get some gas. 
For me, relatively mundane tasks like this can offer a lot of satisfaction and be rewarding when done right. When the system has already been introduced and persists throughout the whole game, like keeping your shoes in good condition in Death Stranding, or even more similar, finding gas to power the generator in Darkwood, the, some would say, boring deviation from the core gameplay, for me, becomes part of the experience itself. Neither of those are boring. I love that I have to pack an extra pair of boots for Sam, or go out of my way to hunt for gas. But the difference with Zombie U is that this make sure you have enough fuel thing isn't real. It's not a system that's been established that impacts any aspect of the game, and this isn't a simulated world that keeps going without your involvement. This is just a contrivance to give you an objective at this moment. This isn't meant to be a wholesale critique on Zombie U. I'm not sure that'd be very fair, considering this came out in 2012 with what looks like not a great deal of development time. I'm simply explaining that I have the capacity to adore these sorts of chores that others find dull, and with Zombie U, it doesn't scratch that itch at all. It's another in the long line of quests that pop up, which only exist to make you explore a different area. As lame as this pretend goal is, of finding fuel, everything it leads to is amazing. Literally, this is my favorite stretch of gameplay in the entire game. The yard area with mines in the middle, the jammer nearby, the coded scavenger hunt messages, and of course, lots of zombies to deal with in whatever way you choose. Sadly, yes, the strange cutscene I mentioned earlier is what this area is connected to, but afterwards is the... Hold on, not yet, not yet, almost. The Wallace and Gromit looking fellow named Vikram, who runs the gas station, thinks you're his kid for some reason, and asks you to get him medicine, and gives you the key card to the gate behind his house. Be quick, she needs those antibiotics. Uh, don't forget your key. The prepper isn't happy, he thinks Vikram is sending you to die. Honestly, that's not too far off. The place where the medicine is located is inside an elementary school. I know the limitations of an M rating, so I wasn't expecting much here, but the moment I walked in, I realized how little I was giving the game credit. You could cut the tension with a knife as I was walking around in this opening room. Lightning outside every once in a while, toys making noises only to fade away, a lullaby sounding now and again. The air itself feels thick and sickly. Walking around and seeing the bloody remains of this classroom had me so on edge. Crawl through a vent. Jesus Christ. Okay. Slowly walk in the hallway and BAM! Oh, just a singular zombie. Okay, maybe this isn't so bad. Not fun, I don't want to be here anymore, but let's just keep going. The lights flicker, more blood trails, more lightning. Alright, alright. Upstairs just has zombies. Let's go... Downstairs, I guess. Oh shit, zombie at the door. No problem, no problem, keep going. A very eerie bathroom. And then... What the fuck was that? This is a zombie game, not a paranormal game with ghosts. Literally, those are the words I was saying out loud. Well, after I screamed like a girl anyway. Spirits and supernatural stuff are one of my three core fears. If a horror anything has it, there's a high chance it may fucking terrify me. But I had to keep pressing onwards, even though I genuinely wanted to stop playing the game forever. This video has to get made. Zombies Ate My Neighbors fell through. Zombie U isn't. After hearing a slightly horrifying recording, going back and forth between a normal kid recording his voice and the teacher screaming for help while the zombies break their way in, we find the key card for the door we're trying to get into. Something that seems so obvious in hindsight is that my flashlight battery is almost empty, but at the time, I was in such a rush to get out of this pit of hell that I was forgetting the essentials and moving as fast as I could. Then, we fall down into the basement, and right now, I'm already freaking out. My plans for a fast escape completely tossed out the window, and then I hear this. Already nearly shitting myself, after aimlessly wandering through a dark room with the flashlight flickering, another ghostly presence makes itself known. Now, I realize it may look ridiculous and silly, but this white holographic outline effect thing, plus the fact that it kept disappearing, was enough for me to view this as not just a regular zombie, but as a petrifying paranormal entity. I was already sweating a bunch when this was happening, and screamed once already, but that was nothing compared to what happened after she finally died. If you don't like jump scares, look away from the screen or skip ahead. Oh, there you are. Right. 
That was definitely not the store. Not only did I visibly jump in my chair, I screamed loud enough to wake up my girlfriend. It wasn't an abrupt startle yell either. This was a prolonged, get this creepy face out of my vision scream. Fuck man, fuck. Maybe it's good that I tucked this section away until now. Fewer people will see how much of a goddamn wuss I am. Still not out of the woods yet. I had to find the combination code for the door, but also my flashlight was almost out. So better wait in a dark secluded fucking corner, desperately hoping nothing else gets sprung on me. Fun fact, I was still so scared that when it came time to find the four numbers on the wall written in jizz to open the keypad door, I found three of them and just fucking went for it, trying everything until it opened. I didn't want to spend another second in that room. At this point, the atmosphere still has me tremendously unsettled. We do have the prepper's radio back, but the lights are fucky, I'm in the basement still, and who knows if there will be any more apparitions up ahead. Finally, we get back upstairs as zombies start rushing in, and... Let me tell you, the feeling I had of exiting the school, being back on the outside, was out of this world. This is one of the reasons I wasn't as thorough as I should have been. I didn't want to play the game all the way through again, because I didn't want to go into this goddamn school again. Being actually scared is such a strange feeling. I hated it, but in retrospect, it was awesome. The rush of finding the exit at long last was so goddamn cathartic, I got chills. Like the sensation you get when you think about how close you were to getting hit by a car, or being really cold and finally getting into a place that's warm. No? Just me? Anyway, like I said in the beginning, this may feel a little cheap. Yeah, it freaked me out, but it wasn't a zombie-related scare. It was playing on my fear of an entirely different subgenre of horror. If I knew the game would have ghosts, this wouldn't have caught me off guard as much. And I likely wouldn't have played it, I won't lie. Take of that what you will, I still count it as fair, one of the most terrifying moments I've ever experienced in a zombie game. On our way back to the gas station again, we get a distress call from a girl holding up in a church asking for help, saying she can trade guns and food. The prepper susses it out immediately, saying it's a trap, but that doesn't really matter when it comes to the omniscient objective marker, it's now one of our goals. First, we need the Jerry upgrade from the gas station quest being completed, so we return with the medicine, and the dad apparently turned into a zombie and killed his kid. Pretty gruesome to be honest, I didn't expect them to show the dead boy. We nab the upgrade to the Jerry, which allows us to hack certain doors and grab the fuel. Here's a fun awkward detail. When you return and refuel the generator, the prepper says nothing, and the quest just goes away, leaving you with the distress call quest and Dee's letters. Okay, I guess, but if you, say, nabbed some letters, then saved and quit, when you load back in, the prepper's back in the swing of things dialogue starts up, and he yells at you for not looking out for number one, even though you've shown no signs of going to the church to help the girl yet. My goodness. This distress call quest from the girl is the other major deviation I was speaking about earlier, one that is opposite of the elementary school in almost every way. Let me explain why. On a surface level, obviously they're miles apart. One is tense and scary, and the other is loud and action-oriented. You get captured and fight off zombies in a makeshift gladiator arena. Yeah, the save the girl thing was a trap, of course. I don't think it's fun, but it's in the game. There you go. For me though, the objectives that lead to both of these are what makes them so interesting. Neither serve the narrative. I mean, if there even is one at this point. We've just been following orders from the Prepper, Doctor, and Sandra up until now. But that's what I'm talking about. Why does our character feel the urge to do this? The task itself of finding fuel for the home base is dull and arguably unnecessary, at least for the player character, and yet we do it. Of course we do it. The prepper told us to. But the prepper says not to save the girl, but we try anyway, because the game demands it? Is there some would-you-kindly Bioshock-esque trickery going on with our character where they are forced into doing anything anyone asks of us? Zombie U has a severe character motivation issue, among many others, and it stems from the decision to blend together a linear game with a somewhat structured series of objectives and story beats, with a faceless companion who both has to be the reliable and helpful guide while also going against what other characters and you as a player think later on, while never being on screen, never interacting with anyone else in the game, and never letting our character speak. The latter is a charitable view, by the way, a single survivor who takes on the role of silent protagonist for the whole journey, opposed to the much more likely cavalcade of random nobodies that merry-go-round through this game world, accepting the title of the only person who can do anything in this ransacked city. Maybe the Bioshock gimmick would be a decent cop-out without that, but the death mechanic of new people populating this main character role makes no sense. These ideas don't work together. This game doesn't know what it wants to be, which makes for such a confusing play experience. 
When I said the game was confusing in the intro, I didn't mean that it's hard to understand the lore or something. No, it's because the game is jam-packed with so many mismatched concepts that you can't help but be a little disoriented even when just following the objective markers. Did you know that in Zombie U, you can eat animal meat from rats and birds? It even has a risk versus reward aspect to it. It'll damage you if it's spoiled or something. Unreal, yeah, why not? It could be a cool mechanic for some type of game. Not this one, but something. Sure, throw it in the cauldron, along with everything else. Who cares? It takes a lot to make a stew, after all. I've definitely talked about the story and progression of Zombie U far more than I was intending, but it was all to get to that one point right there. Everything after this is pretty bad anyway, so I'll be far more brief than before. If you already found and handed over these letters, the doctor will call you back, but if not, go round up the last of the letters and hand him over. For me, I gave him the letters afterwards, then he just sat there and did nothing, so I had to return to the safe house, where the prepper freaks out that I've been gone for so long down there? Huh? And right at that moment, the doctor calls and says he's figured it out. The panacea is a vaccine, not a cure. Come right away. Now we've done it, the prepper goes ballistic, saying, That's why you've been down there? And all that, the cure won't work, and yada yada. He says he thought we were partners. What? He even says, Meanwhile, the safe house is vulnerable. Dude, what are you talking about? This is not a system present in Zombie U. The safe house is fine. Also, where are you? He ends with the prepper out. So I guess he's all done with us. Would have been a lot more impactful if the CCTV monitors went out after he said that, but whatever. When we return to the palace, the doctor isn't where he was before, and we still can't get into that one door that hasn't opened yet that needs a retinal scanner. Welp, this doesn't sound good. The palace is brimming with zombies again for some reason, and on the way to find the doctor, the... Ghostly zombies make an appearance again. Yes, in case you were wondering, I was very scared yet again. I was also in a rush, blitzing past zombies when I could, since I really wanted the game to be over at this point. We find the doctor zombified in a room really far away for some reason, and we take his eyeball after we kill him. Make our way into the area of the palace we haven't been to yet, flooded section with zombies, more ghostly scares to fuck with me, we grab the panacea code in the basement computer or something, and we have to escape while the alarms are going off. We take a very tedious route back to the safe house, gather our belongings to head out, and the prepper goes on and on about how ungrateful we are, how everyone is conspiring behind his back, get out of my safe house, and so on. There are more zombies on the way out to fight, but since his voice changes from him being in our Jerry to just yelling in the building, I figured this would be a boss fight against him, but nah, just keep running, and then, after you get to the exit, a cutscene plays, showing a first-person view of the prepper walking in the safe house. Then we see him for real, checking out the item chest. Oh look, he lost his foot or something. He goes to check on his mountain of supplies, and the camera pans to the monitors again, but not before showing a glimpse of something interesting. Are these pictures of survivors he saved with a score given to them? I don't recognize any of my people here, so I don't think it's the player characters. How odd. The game ends with the prepper finding another person and introducing himself. The implication, I believe, that he'll keep on doing what he was doing, saving people one by one. But why? Also, yeah, the credits roll after this. Embarrassing, I know. But back to the question. What is the deal with the prepper? Why weren't we allowed to see him until now? Is he a giant hypocrite? He says the people who haven't prepared can't be saved, to look out for number one, not to stick your neck out for other people, but he continues to help out survivors? I've seen some people view this cutscene as a way of showing that the prepper was manipulating you into doing his bidding, much like he's done with the other survivors, and I kind of get that theory, but I also don't. He does walk to the chest you've been putting items in to presumably take your stuff, but that just isn't enough for me. What, he comes in when the person is dead or gone to take... Like, three wooden planks and a couple empty guns? Again, if there was a reason to hoard a bunch of food or something here, maybe I could see it. And perhaps if sometimes stuff went missing from the inventory? Or he pretended he made extra room for you in the chest since you were gone? I don't know, it's too flimsy for my liking. Personally, I think he's at least a little bit proud of Kaz playing the role of leader, being the one to give orders and get people back on their feet. Power hungry? 
Perhaps. He's had a rough history, given that he tried to warn the Queen about the upcoming plague and was thrown into an insane asylum. Sandra left him to go be with Ron, and even after the Queen released him from the institution, he couldn't get his former life back. He's isolated himself from his former friends and allies, and now his best student, the player character, is trying to run off with his ex and leave him alone again. Poor guy. I don't know how good of a person he is at this point. He sounds very bitter and jaded. And it's worth noting that when he initially offered to help us, he drew the zombies to the main character. He essentially put us into harm's way so we'd feel indebted to him. But even still, I'm sympathetic to him, if only a little. Given that he's named John, just like his idol John D, and both were viewed as nutcases when they tried to warn the person in power about the Black Prophecy, I do wonder what the developers are trying to say with this. Is it that black and white? We're just supposed to view both of their falls from grace as similarly tragic and move on? Just seems kind of weird to name the Prepper John, with us only figuring it out through the lore entries that the Prepper is that guy, with us also reading lore entries about John D at the same time, essentially. Maybe that was the point, to be slightly confusing and ultimately be a twist for players who are attentive? Either way, this cutscene is a terrible segue into the credits. It came out of nowhere and is deflating, and the after credits bit, where you have to race to the helicopter again, also sucks. If you die here, by the way, the game is over, you don't get to try again. I died since I was pretty over the game already, so being careful and taking out the zombies in a safe manner was completely out of the question. After watching someone actually complete the escape sequence and get the best ending, I can't believe how close I was to getting the ending. I was right fucking there. It's infuriating. Actually, not really. There's literally nothing of note that happens. Some say that the hand that reaches to save you is a zombified hand, but I'm not seeing that. Now the Black Angels will carpet bomb the place, just as John D predicted, and that's the game. I have to give them some credit with this ending section, though, since Sandra says at the beginning of it that she's not sure if this is the same person as last time, but you're on the same frequency, so she'll try to help you out anyway. Wow, unbelievable! They actually took the death mechanic into account, finally! Before wrapping up, I should briefly go over the asymmetrical multiplayer modes. This is a Wii U exclusive feature. It's not on the PS4 version, for obvious reasons, so it's probably good for history's sake to talk about it, given that barely anybody played it or will ever play it again in the future. One person is a survivor and uses the Wiimote and Nunchuck, and the other uses the gamepad to spawn in zombies on the map to fight off the survivor or capture flags. Most of the footage will be of the survivor component, naturally, but essentially there's red zones where you can't place zombies and everywhere else is fair game. This means zombies can essentially spawn right behind you at times, which isn't the greatest strategy when you're King Boris, the king of zombies, but it can work when your opponent is fighting their hardest with the controls as the survivor. Seriously, going from playing the game with the gamepad to aiming with the Wiimote is a pretty jarring transition. The worst of it all is when you're trying to grab ammo or aim at a zombie on the ground. Not only does your reticle get blocked by the gun model at times, making it hard to judge where you're aiming, but if you cross the invisible line when pointing the gun at the lower part of your screen, the camera will shift as well as your cursor going lower. There's like this impossible space where you can't keep your aimer pointed at, which actually cost me a game in the bunker map. I hear you can use the Wii U Pro Controller instead when as the survivor, so I can't complain too much. It's nice that this is even an option to be honest. The main game mode is Capture the Flag, and it's not bad. The Survivor and Zombie King both will most likely capture a flag right off the bat, but the speed at which the Survivor captures a flag zone feels pretty good, considering the gamepad player can work on two at once and throw a lot of zombies at one flag the player isn't close to. As the Survivor, you pick a loadout beforehand, no melee options it seems, which is fine. There are automated turrets and ammo boxes to grab on the map, the auto turrets being really cool additions for this game mode, and eventually you might earn some other items like mines and health packs. The player on the gamepad, King Boris, is able to pick specific zombies that fit their current goals, all at a different cost. The grunts are the most expensive, costing 10, which makes sense since they're the only ones that seek out flags to capture. Er, destroy maybe? They look like they're attacking the flag itself. When King Boris levels up, you get a new zombie to play with out of three options, such as Spitter, Helmet Zombie, Bomber, and so on. Fun stuff, I think this is all really neat. The maps are all based off the campaign mode in some way, and feel like a good amount of effort was put in to making them work for a multiplayer game mode. And the voice acting for the announcer is just awesome, no notes. And there's the new flag! Get moving! A new flag is up for grabs, dudes and dead people! Move it! A big hand for our players, please! And remember, Survivors vs. Zombies is made possible by the benevolent hand of King Boris. All hail the king! 
The kill box mode is just the gamepad player spawning zombies to kill the survivor, and that's about it. Here, as the human player, you can keep grabbing and replacing your weapons as you wander the play space, but sadly, this game mode ended on a sour note, since it glitched or something, prohibiting me from doing anything after I tried to grab a new gun and reload at the same time. Oopsie whoopsie. Awesome. Bugs. A zombie you classic. The weirdest part about all this to me was how cumbersome it was to change maps, and how the gamepad player constantly had to go back and forth between looking at the screen or looking at their pad. You have to quit out of the game if you want to change the map up or settings, which means you have to confirm your controller again. Extra odd, since you're given the option to restart with the same roles, or restart with the opposite roles. Literally all this does is swaps the player 1 and player 2 names at the top, and affects the leaderboard at the end. I mean, maybe kiddos out there cared about their win-loss record, but having two options in the menu to restart, where the other one just flips the names, instead of having a restart on new map option is wild to me. Lastly, yeah, just kind of odd that the gamepad has Will You Survive on it pre- and post-game. You've been staring at the Wii U gamepad the whole time, and the gamepad person is who controls the menu, so I'm not sure why they couldn't have showed the menus on the pad itself too. Those small negative quibbles aside, I really dig the Zombie U multiplayer stuff. Sure, Capture the Flag more resembles Annex from Gears of War, and the lack of settings is likely to make it stale after a few hours, but... Fuck, this is one gimmick of the Wii U that I'm all about. Taking advantage of the gamepad by sticking a player there and a player on the TV? Fucking awesome. This is a load of fun. If I had to guess, I'd say this was something the dev team were likely already sold on when this was originally Killer Freaks from Outer Space. Remember how this was going to be a raving rabbit sort of thing initially? Yeah, these little dudes are meant to be similar to the rabbits, and they were going to let players finally murder them in an M-rated game. I can easily see this lighthearted King of Zombies mode slide right into that setting and tone. In fact, it would have probably felt a lot better. Going from the main campaign to this is a bit odd. I suppose it's just the arena section from the main game, but expanded upon, kind of like some of the best RE7 DLCs, so I can't complain too much. That said, I think Killer Freaks from Outer Space is a far better name than Zombie U, and considering how played out zombies are, not that I'm specifically complaining, you see my channel after all, if anything I'm getting Stockholm Syndrome at this point, but even still, the game from that E3 2011 trailer looks and sounds a lot more interesting than Zombie without the E and add a U. <sighs> I want to like this game, I really do. There are so many interesting ideas here, but so much of the game is mediocre, and a good portion that's simply outright bad. Overall, Zombie U is so... weird. It's the most volatile middling game I've ever played. It jumps back and forth constantly between dog shit and brilliance. Neither of the versions are ideal. The Wii U and its utterly terrible gamepad gimmicks, the ridiculous dirty camera lens effects, the 720p resolution, and the god-awful load times. The PS4 and PC ports with their crashing issues that might ruin your whole play experience, strange inventory limitations that work against the new melee weapons they've added, and the lack of the cool multiplayer modes. The backstory and setting aren't bad, but the narrative is incredibly weak, the characters are stiff, the silent protagonist shtick doesn't feel natural with this game at all, and the death mechanic flat out makes no sense with this linear game. The Jerry itself is a fun tool to use, there were many great scares, more than most zombie games I'd say, even without the ghost incident, and the gameplay at its best was tense and rewarding. I've been playing Project Zomboid a bit lately. Well, I had to stop when writing for this game, since I didn't want to confuse the two by accident, but it just made me think, wow, if I could play a version of Project Zomboid with the perspective and gameplay of Zombie U, or if Zombie U was as open and expansive as Project Zomboid, or if Project Zomboid had anything resembling a narrative goal for the player like Zombie U? Just... Man, maybe I'm alone in this, but they felt very similar at times, specifically when thinking of when both games were at their best, anyway. Don't count on Project Zomboid being the next zombie game on the channel, by the way. You all know what's on deck, what I've been keeping from you. Sorry for neglecting you, little algorithm. Will you do a thing when I make a Left 4 Dead 2 video? You better, you son of a- Thanks for sticking through this surprisingly lengthy look at a mostly mediocre game. Thanks to my patrons who support me with real money, some of whom should be on screen right about now. You can join my Discord channel if you're interested in recommending me games to review, ask me questions, or hang out and trade thoughts about The Last of Us Part 2 or something. I don't know. Watch something else of mine, subscribe to the channel if you haven't yet, and I'll see you next time. Have a good one. Yay.